Yeah. Righty-o. Well, well, we'll get into it now. Everybody's everybody's here. Um, so as you as you're probably well aware, um, today's session we're we're going to do the the client console bit work, which is um, based around you guys asking questions, and we'll we'll have another run through that as well before we before we start that that client console. Then um, while while we so. I'll go off with one person, one after the other. It's a 10 minute consult, a little bit of time in between. It's going to take roughly an hour. Um, so while while we're doing that, there is there is the quiz, there is, um, and you you guys can keep working on your on your projects, and we'll also uh, run through that that procedure document um, before before we go uh, go off to the client consult to remind you guys of some other things you might want to might want to ask. In that in that process, and also it's an opportunity for you guys to, to clarify anything. So, so we'll do that for the for the first session, and then we can start getting into some of the drawing aspects as well, and looking at some of the documentation supplied, getting you guys ready to do the building designer consult after lunch. So that's that's going to be our our session today. So so first up, client consult, then the building designer consult after that. Now it's likely with the client consult after we do that, you guys are going to have to be looking for some more information, clarifying things, and and pulling things together. We'll see if um, you get plenty. Of, you, we'll see if you can get, have some time for doing that today. Obviously, those of you who get the um, building design con or building designers consult done earlier, will have a little bit more time to, to work on additional things afterwards. But for those of you who want a bit of a bit more time preparing for building design consult, you might want to go go last. So, what I've got in my pocket is I've got a number of one to four. I can randomly select people in the order we do the do the client consult, the first one, or um, if people feel they really want a bit more time to prepare, I'm also willing to, to order things. I'll have a crack off the bat. You have a crack off the bat. Yeah, why not? Yeah. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And probably, probably yeah, yeah, yeah. And probably not, probably not, probably not, probably not the worst approach. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'll be, I'll be learning as well. So I've got to be, much. That's how I learn. Yeah. 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 Rule it first. Do it. Bang it up. Yeah. All right. So, all right. So, any nominations in for second? So, first up, what we'll have a bit of a bit of run through today is the procedure document. So, document that you're most likely uh, fairly uh, fairly familiar with already, but we'll we'll run through it just to ensure that that everything everything's uh, covered in class, and also that everything's sort of spoken about and covered for the external students as well. In that regard, so so your client brief. Your client wishes to build build the design provided on their newly acquired site at 174 Shepherd's Hill Road, Bellevue Heights, to maximise views and passive design principles. So, when we talk about passive design principles, that's about making the best use of the sun. Um, you know, getting sun in winter, not so much in summer. They would like to remove the front fence and extend the deck from the mills area to three metres. By three meters. So we've got to, got to be thinking about about um, deck, about accommodation for deck, space for deck. Is that deck the best use of these views? All these these types of things. Um, is that deck going to burn in a bushfire, or the and etc. And we've got to think about about front front fence. When we start touching front fences, then the council probably wants to be involved. Um, if we if we if we're touching that touching that front fence. Um, we'll probably want a front a fence back there. How how will we do that in accordance with the, with the council? So many of you have already picked up on that, as I can see from 
from your submissions of, of work already. But using the Revit model provided, um, research requirements for 174 Shepherd's Hill Road, Bellevue Heights, and locate council for planning approval. So all of you have done that, and that's that's great. That's all fine. Uh, confirm dimensions, materials, conformity of information stated on specifications and reports to compliance and client requirements. So you've got to have a bit of a look at, at some of the information supplied and go, is this information actually relevant to that building? Have, have they chucked in the wrong thing for that building? Um, are there any mistakes in that, etc.? Um, and then does it does it comply with everything that it needs to needs to comply with? So develop models to meet requirements of your site now analysis. So so your site analysis to think about the site, think about the about the contours, the existing vegetation, the context of the site being on a on a um, main road, a sloping sloping block. Think about the the um, climate and the microclimate, um, breezes, etc., coming through there, and views from, from the block. Um, for any of you who, I think, has ev everybody's driven past the site, haven't they? No? No? Right, okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, something that is not, maybe it's not too evident, and you, and I guess essentially you, you're discouraged from, from going and, and visiting the and site. And provided photos yeah. of from around the site. Okay. That's how we got some of the information that is on the non-compliant stuff. Okay, right. So, yeah. yeah, it could be good to get those photos from, from Anne Marie. She took them on the site, did she? She's been, well, actually been on. Part of our non-compliance course, right. she was actually put photos. Uh, I could probably find them. Yeah, okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. we won't get into that, that right now, but um, but that'd be great. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's excellent, because they're not in the, not in the um, uh, materials for this this subject, but one thing you do notice is there's a bit of a view of the sea. There's there's view over over built up urban areas out out to the sea. I haven't been on the site. I can't you know my guess is as good as yours. But from from on Shepherd's Hill Road, you can see that there's there's a bit of a view out the back, and yeah, and we'll probably probably want to want to maximise that and, and think about that. Um. Materials. So, so our, our materials have to um, have certainly have to be be compliant, but but we also think about noise control. It's on a it's on a busy road. You know, what are what are great ways of controlling noise with, with materials? So yeah, double glazing. Yeah, yeah, and that you know that, that's insulation can be soundproofing as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, other. Um, no, I won't. I won't actually. No, I won't. Won't oh, leave. But yes. Yeah. 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 Yep. That's what I would recommend. Not get rid of that fence. Just lowering it. Mm. It does provide heat, like sound block, everything from that main road. You just lowered it, rendered it to soften its appearance. Mm -hmm. It looks a lot nicer. Maybe yeah. putting wood and maybe a gate on it. Yeah. Take that over, please. Yeah, take that. I just want to say ugly because it looks what it does look like in those photos is very like, harsh, but, ugly, yeah, yeah. concrete brick wall. You yeah. lift it, make it softer, it costs yeah. a lot of money. Lower the tire to make it compliant. Be cheaper than replacing. That's right, and then just put a automated gate, even a gate on rollers. You know, mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily need to be automated, and that would block an awful lot of sound and give you an awful lot of privacy from that road. Mm. I'd say that's why it was built to that magnitude in the first place. Yes, yeah, yeah, it's to, yeah, for sound attenuation. Yeah, but, I think that would yeah. be a cheaper option rather than yeah. knocking the whole thing down and getting a new fence engineered for the front. Yeah, so, yeah, so good, great, great discussion for, um, yeah, with, with the client. Um, got to think about, so, with our materials, noise control um, and energy efficiency. So, energy efficiency, as we covered last week, can, can be in... How, how well it, it makes the building perform for its energy use, for, for keeping it keeping it warm in winter, cool in, cool in summer, reducing the amount of energy that's required. But also, energy efficiency can relate to embodied energy of materials. So, you know, so materials that, that have don't pr 
don't require much energy to produce. For example, a, a, a wall, yeah, a wall with with low embodied energy or very low embodied energy, probably the best option for that is timber frame with um, lightweight sheet cladding. I don't know what's what's lowest out of embodied energy between sheet metal or fibre cement sheet, but they're both pretty low. So, um, so either either one of those options, and then as you get further into into your masonry and your baked masonry like like bricks etc well then then your embodied energy goes up stone i guess essentially a lower embodied energy but there's still a decent amount of embodied energy in the actual mortar the, the cement for the for the mortar and the and the hydrated lime and so on um, getting the stone from point a to point b it does yeah yeah so and some of those things are not so easily calculated as well um, yeah. But yeah, you've got to, you've got to think about that, that supply of stone. Now, now um, I don't know if they're still mining um, sandstone in Mitcham anymore, it's pretty close, but, but any, anyhow, yeah, um, but, you might, but you might be bringing like slate from Wollonga or something to do stacked stone walls or, or so, well there's, yeah, Canman too, that, that sort, of, sort of thing, so there's, there's a bit of, bit of travel in that. Um, yeah, so, so the client Client wants wants energy efficiency. Um, fire, will we know that that's um, a medium? Well, it's it's classified as medium, and then we have to determine the bushfire attack level from that. I think everybody's done that already and is quite comfortable with that. Development plan. So everybody's seen the development plan, become fairly familiar with it. There might be a bit more familiarity you need to have for this, and which you which you'll find. Uh, You'll need to develop sheets to meet requirements for planning approval. So the first sheet is a cover sheet, provides some 3D views of, of the premises, include client's name and contact details, project title and site address, student details and then um, a sheet schedule, so it's so a list, list of your sheets. Site analysis. Neighbouring structures, services, vegetation, fence, and shadows. So think about how how we can provide some information about about neighbouring structures. You know, it's going to be part diagrammatic form, part part written. But because these are these are drawn, we you know we we try to limit the written component on our, on our drawings. Um, provide some information about services. Yeah, some information about, about vegetation and fence and shadows. You want a want a site plan uh, dimensioned with a north indicator, including contours, dimensioned site setbacks. North indicator accurately placed on the plan. So take direction from Google Maps or, or any of the other online uh, mapping. Uh, site access egress from side, um, from roadside and around site. So think about think about your driveway and so on. And need to have a floor plan fully dimensioned north north indicator once again total floor area. It'll need to be dimensioned and I think everybody here is is fairly um, fairly good or with their understanding of dimensions. We might might run through that. Um, a little later on, as we as we as we cover the plans, depending on how much time we get to, to cover plans today, wall openings, um, external doors, windows, rooms, and wall thicknesses. So all of your standard information that's on a on a floor floor plan. Uh, oh, door clearances. That's not always not always on a on a floor plan. So we can include things like door clearances by our door information. Now we might want to do that. As a door schedule, so we have D1, D2, D3, etc., and then list our attributes of doors. I think that's definitely the neater way to do it. You can also um, put on put on door heights, etc., within your little door legend as well, like for each each door. I tend to think that that's a bit bit messier. And the door schedule enables you to include a bit more information as well at a later date. Um, what certainly what we don't want want to have happening is replication of that information where we'll have you know door you know door two and then then 
H20 door, 2100 pi or 2040 pi, etc., on the plan, and then also have a schedule as well. We yeah, want to avoid that, but Revit doesn't do that anyhow. So um, we we'll want uh, window door tags, so identification of those windows and doors. We we'll want to have information about wall construction. So the way we convey wall construction is through hatching. So we show what type of wall it is by a, what hatch we apply to that wall. But then we also use leaders. So um, specify that. Um, sections, two sections, all aspects to be supported on detail sheets from, re from reports um, provided and or reference to the National Construction Code and Australian standards, including relevant specific clauses. So um, you'll have to include in there the roof structure, the wall structure, the floor structure, internal materials, clearly, clearly labelled, for example, if cladding is selected, what kind of cladding, what render or colour, if there is a render. Provide a 3D view, so um, two external views in, including site contours, two internal views including furniture. Sustainability sheet, so positioning on block and solar requirement slash panels. So what I've what I've done today um, is included a, a solar panel calculator there on the site. Might might be a good good thing to um, ask the client, you know, what their you know what their energy usage is, what their what their energy usage patterns are for for determining uh, solar panels and and, and requirements. Um, door and window schedule, appropriate label of doors, windows, reports. So solar panel reports supporting selection of panel type and number. So it's about, about working working that out. Consult product specification taken from online res research. You also have to produce a fire safety report. So students will develop a fire safety report for this specific fire zone or location. Establish fire zone for this address. See development plans, maps for location slash zone. Consult National Construction Code um, to determine bushfire attack level. Well, I think everybody's everybody's at that already. The reports you want done on obviously on Word documents. Yes. Yeah. And and um, by by report, it's simply very neatly collate well it's neatly but easily read just information so so it's not about not about telling a story and not not about telling me how important it is to be prepared for bushfires and all that sort of stuff it's about this is what it is this is the site etc BAL da, 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 da. these are the important considerations so summarize into a report the construction aspects required so quoting from quoting from clauses from national construction code and AS 3959 so we'll have we'll have to have a have a good look at that, but that helps you then further on in, into. Although you guys probably covered that fairly well in compliance already. No, you didn't cover AS thirty nine fifty nine. That's that's for bushfire requirements. So oh, well, so we would have, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, just just in a in a nutshell in thinking about, about bushfire requirements. So you've got a bushfire attack level for, for every location. Well, on the on the council's plans, SA map view, etc., it'll show you as low, medium, and high. And then that low, medium, and high are broken up into, into various bushfire attack levels. And yeah, um, yeah, won't, won't go further into that. But then those bushfire attack levels are used within AS 3959 to work out exactly how you should be building yeah. according to that. And so, so the basic requirements are set out for, for BAL 12.5, so the, so the lowest, and it says you know, things, things like um, you've got to, got to have five millimetres between decking, timbers, and, um, and weep holes have to be filled in with mesh and, and these sort of things. It set, sets out all those. It says, okay, that's BAL 12.5. Then it goes BAL 29. For 29, you've got to do this. You've got to have wire 
in your skylight. You've got to have this and this and this. And then for BAL 40, it says all of that plus this, this, this. Flame zone, all of that stuff plus that and that and that and that. And that's, yeah, that's pretty much how it's, how it's structured. Yeah, and so, so you've, and it's, 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 no, it's no small feat sort of summarising into a report the construction aspects required. Um, because, like, as you know, the National Construction Code is written a little bit like a self referencing rabbit warren, there's bits and pieces of information all over the place. Can be can be hard to, hard to pull together. Um, so don't uh, underestimate that as a task. Um, so, uh, so summarising to report the construction aspects required Ligging for. Do you say snippets in that report? Like if we go to so, the NCC, we're going to say you'd be able to snip the relevant bits, but then rather than trying to pop it all in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's that's prop. That is probably a very very good approach. Yeah. As long as you don't end up snipping too much irrelevant information yeah. as well. So, so under under this, so we've got summarising to report construction aspects required, and then we've got a bunch of headings here: floor systems, posts, columns, stumps, piers, and poles, external walls. If you can find the relevant bits for each of those, that's a fantastic way. To put it together. If some of this, like gutters and downpipes, sort of spread out over bits, yeah, you're going to have to go do this, if that, or this, if that yeah. scenario. So, yeah, so, but yeah, certainly make it as easy for yourself as you can. I'm fine with that. So, go look at uh, floor systems, how our floor systems comply with bushfire attack level. Posts, columns, stumps, piers, and poles. What we have to do in that regard. External walls, windows, external doors, vents and weep holes. Roofs, roof lights, roof mounted evaporative cooling units, roof penetrations, gutters and downpipes, water and gas supply pipes, verandas, decks, steps, ramps, and landings. Any additional requirements set out by council. So so that's so that's all the stuff from AS thirty nine, all thirty nine fifty nine, all those um, headings. But then after that, additional requirements set up by council if council have made any additional requirements in regards to that. And then you have to submit for planning approval, council development plan requirements, completed required application forms including power line notification. So a copy of council requirements, fees from website, PDF of sheets as specified. So much of that you've done already, and it's about getting getting those sheets and reports in order. You'll also have to seek feedback and make modifications requested within the required time frame. So that those things those things will those things will come. So in I think it's it's, it's in week four we have we have uh, checking peer review and and so on, and then. Read, submit, resubmit, and follow up council approval. That's the that's the the task requirements. A bunch of things we've we've ticked off already. Also, what you have to submit with that is your activity log as well. So so please please keep that that up up to date. It's much easier doing that um, as you go than than try to fill it in afterwards. So, some information about the about the building. So this is just a just a very sort of I guess very short summary of the building specification. So footings, see footing plan attached. Has everybody seen the footing plan yet? No. no okay. So there's some yeses and some noes. So have have a bit of a look around for that. One of the things while we're doing the the client. Client consult. Um, if if you feel uh, if you're sitting here um, waiting for, for your turn to do it, and you and you're all ready for your client consult, go on and do the do the quiz. So the quiz about required reports. Do that, and then also under that, there is the folder that includes all of those reports as well. So so have have a look at those and familiarise yourself with those. So there's there's some things relating to footings in there. 
external walls, 90 by 45 NGP 10 timbers. Everybody, everybody here knows what those what those numbers relate to. Yes, yes, James. Sorry, which one? Uh, sorry, 90 by 45 MGP 10. Do you uh, do we no? Machine grade flooring. Yeah. So just just quickly, in a nutshell, um, all of your all of your timber is stress graded. So it's graded as to how much weight it can hold, and yeah, and what its what its what its properties. Uh, yeah, typ typically in, in its ability to, to span a distance. Um, so most of your most of your timber gets an F grading for all your timber. So you've got um, F5 through to typically F, F27, although I think it might go go higher than that. But you've got got this F grade. For pine, you also have an F grade. Like you can get a piece of MGP10, and that that will have a you can have an F grading on that as well. But for, for pine specifically, it has its own special grading. The, the grading which is typically specified is MGP 10, so that's machine graded pine. So it's been through a machine, they've done, they've pushed things against it, seen its density and gone, okay, it's going to behave like this. And they will say whether it's MGP 10 or MGP 12, typically. Almost all the specification you'll ever do in, in regards to uh, pine is going to be in MGP10. The reason for that is because your your stockers will stock like in the in the piece in the size of the timber you need. They'll stock either MGP10 or MGP12. If you've sized everything up and specified it all as MGP10, then when it comes to buying the timber, if you end up not being able to get MGP10 and get 12, that doesn't matter because you've exceeded the requirements. If you go specifying stuff in MGP12, then you do your do your timber takeoff and you and you get that to the, the supplier and you can't get that MGP12 in that particular size, then you've got a you've got a problem. So as designers, specifying an MGP10, but it might get built in in 12 or some aspects of it might get built in 12. So that's that's this bit here, MGP. 10. The 90 by 45, that's the dimensions of that, that piece of timber. So 90 millimetres wide by 45 millimetres um, deep. Typically, um, everything is expressed in you know the longer dimension um, by shorter dimension, except for when we're um, uh, talking about batons. When we, when we lay battens on the flat, we'll say um, 45 by 90 battens. So that way we know they're sitting on the, on the flat. But that, yeah, so that's 90 by 45, that's a, that's a standard size. Um, I have it in here somewhere, I think. Just quickly, yeah, there we go. It's very, very old and faded. Maybe some of you have seen it before. I'll pass, pass it around. Uh, timber sizes for South Australia. So it's just a little little pocket book, and it includes all your all your standard sizes available in South Australia. So and that that's important for designers to know. Um, so this is pretty because, old. Do you know when you use old. the span tables though? It makes no reference to MGP10. It makes reference to the F rating. Yeah. Oh no, no, there are there are there are span tables for MGP10. Oh okay. Yeah, yeah. 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 So so with all your span tables that. That are um, that supplement the timber framing code. Yeah. There you've got yeah you've got MGP10 span tables, MGP12 span tables, and then all your F grading span tables. You've also got span tables specific for uh, WA. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. You've got you've got span tables specific for WA hardwoods as well. Yeah. So yeah, and then F grading associated with those. So, would you so when you're in going into the library? The, obviously the tape site, and you look up the N2 supplements. So yes. You, would you put, if you put N2 MGP10, you've got the different supplement, or? Yeah. So you you get you then get your hopefully 
somewhere up high on your list, you'll get the N1 slash N2 MGP10 table. Yeah. So, so N1 and N2, they sit together in their, in their yeah. table, and then N3 is a, is a separate table. Yeah, the, N, the N1, N2, and N3 MGP10 table, like tables, great ones to just keep all yeah. the time. Um, yeah, I, I don't know how, how you can go, go organising it and, and whatnot, but uh, what, we, what we had at, had at work is had the whole set in a, in a PDF, so you can always just go in and, and, and look at stuff as well. Typically for, for designer these days, that's not so important. You're not using F27 stuff. You know, you, typically typically you're not. But when you're when you're dealing with old houses and reinstating beams in a bungalow on a veranda, that sort of thing, you will. So um, yeah, so that might might be handy if you can get your hands on the, on the whole set. That's that's fantastic. Um, so that's that's what they link relate to. And this one here at 600 centres, that relates to the spacing. So, um, when it says in, in, internal walls, we're talking about the studs, the vertical studs. It Maybe it could be a little bit more specific than that, but that's the reasonable um, way of interpreting that, I think. Oh, it's going... in bathrooms, because in bathrooms there has to be 450. Yes, I know, and this, yeah, yeah, and so this is this is a very simplified yeah. summary of summary of that, and yeah, and they haven't they haven't provided the centres for the external walls, so external walls they should be at 600 as well, and so all your externals, all your internals be at 600 except for your bathrooms for the for the wet area, um, sheeting, that'll um, those ones will have to be at 450 centres, so centres that relates to the spacing of them. Spacing is measured from centre to centre. External cladding, James Hardy Prime Line Weatherboard cladding. So it's a, you know, it's a lightweight, modern um, weatherboard cladding product. Rebate. So information about a rebate is not available. So or there is, is or being a being a frame cladding building, we don't have a rebate on the slab. Everybody knows what rebate relates to. No. Okay, so on, on, a, on a slab, this is our slab here like this, and you know our beam now like that. We have a little section there, and so this is a cross, this is a cross section through our, through our slab. We have a little bit there of, called, a, called a rebate. Now, in this cross section, our timber framing starts there, bottom plate, walls go up here like this. Then we have, start our brickwork there, course and mortar. Second brick, etc. Like that. That rebate exists in brick veneer because almost um, almost always we'll have some water get get in here. We don't want this bottom piece of timber to be sitting at that same level as the brickwork because if and we'll, we'll we also have a flashing nailed up to here and that goes under there. But if any water makes its way under here, in this scenario, this timber is protected. If we have our timber, if we don't have a rebate, if we start our brick wall there, for example, then that, that moisture will get to the stud as well. With, with our weatherboards, we don't, we don't have a rebate. We don't require a rebate because, so this is our slab for weatherboards. So, have our walling timber there and our weatherboards sit on the outside so there's no possibility for the collection of, of moisture for moisture to sit there so that scenario we, we don't need a rebate this scenario we do need a rebate if we're talking about um, changes of cladding with the client that might be that might or, or the building designer that might be a consideration so if we think all right, well, you know, yes, we've got James Hardy Prime Line weatherboard. You know, for that we don't don't need a rebate. But if we want to go to some power panel or we want to go to some brick veneer or rammed earth, or, well, rammed earth will be be different once again. But if we go to, go to these these things, does that need modification then to the slab, and do we need to start thinking about about that and and getting that that slab that, that, that redesigned? You'd bring that up in the building consult, though. Yes, yeah. So that's yeah. So that, that's a consult with the building designer, not 
yeah. not the client. Um, yeah, also remember with this consult with the client, you only have 10 minutes. 10 minutes is not actually a lot, a lot of time for, for discussing stuff. Yes, you you know you probably do want to have a have a quick discussion about you know the client will say oh, I'm thinking about this or you know in relation to what you bring up and you say well look there's there's possibly some costs associated with that additional costs and whatever but probably best not to get bogged down in in discussion over over those aspects too much because we only have have ten minutes to cover a lot so ground level so ground level is 150 millimeters belief beneath FFL. So, anybody know what FFL is? Finish floor level. Finish floor level. Cool. I thought you might have sport, might have, might have come up with something else at that point. Um, and floor to ceiling, 24.30. So that's so we're gonna we'll end up having in you know in most uh, most likely an actual uh, 20 2400 um, finished floor to ceiling. Um, wall insulation. 2.5, so yeah, reasonable, roof insulation, 4.1. So we've got to start thinking about, about climate climate zone, what are the minimum requirements of climate zone, and with that with that climate zone, our colour of roof. So different colours of roof will impact on, on that. Eaves, trimmer, um, so that's, that's just a little piece of timber that helps box the eave and, and carries the um, suffit. Eaves lining, hardy flex lining, so it's a cement sheet lying on the underside of the, the eaves. So it just help help picture it. It's our roof, it's our eave, it's our wall, you know, gutter and basement, whatever, here. So this is our eaves lining here. Our eaves trimmer, the piece of piece of timber, so that piece of timber there. Help box our eave and and the and the eaves lining on the underside of that. Fascia and metal fascia. So this, this piece here that carries the gutter is one of those pressed metal fascias. This, uh, that sort of profile type thing. And then we, you know, it's mounted on there with metal brackets. Um, Eve's mould, so 19 by 19 quarter round. Roof framing as per code, trusses at 1,200 centres. So that's, that's that's some handy information. So trusses, okay. As soon as we, we go, I place being trussed, flexibility with with internal floor plan. Um, no 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 point loads. They're they're self-supporting structure that will span from one side to the other side. Also, as soon as I see the word trusses, I think, okay, with the with the house. All of our load bearings going to be in this wall and on that wall because we're running our trusses from here to here. There's there's no load bearing happening on these these walls here. Um, ceiling batten 70, 70 by 35. So we've got a batten on the underside of our um, our bottom cords for our trusses. So trusses. Uh, trusses going across on that our bottom cord there. We've got a batten on the bottom side of that. So, so we've got our 35 mil batten. So yeah, so so now we're at 23.95 ceiling height, 10 mil plasterboard. That enables a little bit of you know your your, um, your 2400 sheet plasterboard, just a little bit of bit of overlap there. What would you do that? What's that? Why would you batten out? Why wouldn't you just put a 90 by 35 um, ceiling joist in between the 1200 centers? Because you jib off directly to the bottom of the. Yep. Yeah. But yeah, it depends on the span. And uh, what's our span for this this one? We're around the six six meters, six point seven or something, six point, are we? Uh, six point eight nine five. Six point eight nine five. So yeah. six point eight nine five. You're going to need two hanging beams in there to to achieve that. If you're going to have large open open plan room to achieve yeah that um, to achieve those hanging beams, those hanging beams are going to have to have points of support somewhere. Now you don't have the flexibility with your with your floor plan. 
And you've got to think about the size of those hanging beams and as well. And you've got to reduce so, the weight where you can. So yeah. we're going for a ceiling with 35 and reduce the weight. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so you can go, you know, ceiling batten 75, 35, or you can use just those those rondo top hats as as well. So 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 metal um, battens, and then that, yeah, because um, they're going to be they're going to be at 600 centers. Yes, you use more of those than if you were to go intermediate joists. You use twice as many because intermediate joists are 1200 centers. These are at 600, but you won't have a hanging beam. You won't have any any other point loads, etc. Lintels as per code, so that's that's about roof load width over top of our, our openings. Bottom plate 90 by 35, top plate 90 by 45. Doesn't say MGP 10, um, but I would you know, yeah I would I would assume. Oh, there it says there. Right. Okay, well there we unless go. Unless notified otherwise. Yeah, great. Yeah, so yeah, you know, yeah, unless notified otherwise. Uh, roof pitch, 15 degrees pitch main roof, and 5 degree pitch to the veranda. Um, eaves width, 300 mil. So it's just a 300. Typically also when you see stuff expressed um, from designers and engineers and they just use numbers, they mean millimetres. So you know, so sometimes you might have have a 40 EA. You know, that's a 40 millimeter equal angle. Um, same, same thing. E, e width 300. Window size is refer to sketch plan and use standards. Oops. Oh, I'll take off that end. That is there. Standard sizing. Is everybody familiar with standard sizing of doors and windows? Yeah. What's that? Not yeah, not always. So yeah, we we'll, we will we'll go we'll cover that. Um, what standard, standard doors come in eight twenty, seven twenty, six twenty. Yeah. So you yeah. Sometimes get a nine twenty, but you usually have a nine forty. Yeah, and you they and yeah some two eight four zero standard yeah. height. Yes. Yeah, two eight four zero standard height. Um, but also a lot of your sliding doors, things like that, standard heights twenty four hundred. Now you got well. any window um, site. You got anywhere, stick bar, anywhere like that. You can actually see charts of standard window size. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. And so, from from the learn page, there is a link here to stick bar. <laughs> Thank you. Now you can you can you can you can work your way work your way through there. Just you know type in type in there um, standard door and window sizes, or you can just do a Google search, and you'll come up with this this document. So it shows shows all of the standard door window sizes. Now I think I might have to make that a bit oh, shift. No, nah, control's not working either. Uh, it's not letting me maybe letting me zoom into it larger. Is that? Can everybody read that text from where you are? Um, so we've got yeah we've got a, a bunch of information here. Good way to, to look at it is this black row. That's number of bricks. So the width of your windows is measured in number of bricks, and there's very good reason for that. Brick layers don't like cutting bricks unless they're cutting bricks in half. That's the only only way they like to cut a brick. So we've got two and a half bricks, three, three and a half bricks, four. Um, yeah, when it comes to comes to your sheeting sheeting products. You can cut sheeting products a little bit, little bit more, but also a lot of your sheeting products come in increments of 300 millimeters. It's kind of handy with the, with the or handy. Um, there's probably probably no coincidence there, but um, a lot of your a lot of your sizes are in those those 300 millimeter or or thereabouts increments as well. Anyhow, so your tiny little window, which is 600 high by 600 610. Wide, so it works works well for your sheeting products as well. So we've got our number of bricks. That's that's our bricks in in stretcher. So the, so the length of a brick, and 
when it comes to your comes to your doors and windows, yes, you can get a door and window in just about whatever size you want. Yes, you're limited by the glass and the weight of that glass. If you want something massive, well then, um, then you might not be able to have that standard residential thing. If you're building a, a residential dwelling, it is going to be so much cheaper to stick to your standard size doors and windows rather than getting them made. If ever you do get windows specifically made, it's good to get them all made the same size. Because um, if you're specifying you know, unique windows, all of those are unique in your project, that's just going to be very expensive. Even you, you look at your, your commercial stuff, now this stuff will be made specifically. They will have measured in here and gone, that's how long it needs to be. Let's divide it up by this, these increments so we go with you know, um, four mil or five mil glass. And then they'll have some odd increments. So they'll have like, you know, windows that are, that are 12, 13 wide, for example. But you notice they're all 12, 13. Um, with, our, with our residential development, to keep it um, sort of within budget, things have to be in budget, particularly in residential, we stick to our standard size door, door and windows. So, so have, have a look at that. And then there are standard sizes. So that's for awning windows. So that's, that's windows that open out like this, like an awning. But then there are casement windows. So side opening windows, fixed window standard sizes, bifold doors, etc. Sliding patio doors. Oh, and also the your um, door frame, like standard door frame sizes. But then also um, laundry combination standard sizes as well. So yeah, steg bars probably the best um, best resource for that. They're all very easily laid out. And also, while all our, our oh yeah, also I didn't, didn't show. So we've got a number of bricks, but then we've got our stud openings. So that's that's with a um, that's with the aluminium. Uh, so what is it? That's 26 and that's wider. So that's that's to include your aluminium. That 2670 is, is for the inside of your frame, so other materials. And then 26, oh sorry, well the 26, uh, uh, what did we are? Uh, can't see that. Yeah, um, can't read that one, but anyhow, that's that's your that's the that's the inside of your your, your frame. And then yeah, that's you know, that's these are your these are your stud openings for your various different options how you want to want to show that show that reveal or no reveal. And then of course you've got the same um, on the other on the other side there showing your height of bricks, so your number of bricks. So that's our standard size doors and windows. Um, window head height, 2100. Also, it's a very standard thing to have all of your doors and windows terminate at the, at the same height. You'll probably notice this if you've, if you've ever drawn up an elevation and you don't have your door and windows all at that, that same height, it looks odd. Um, so, Everybody, does everybody know what I mean about that, that head height? Um, Conway, yeah, yeah, cool with that, yeah, cool. So, yeah, so 2100 is our door and window head height. Uh, cornices, so that's 55 mil cove cornice. Cove cornice is just that quarter round shaped cornice like that that sits in the, in the corner, junction between the wall and the ceiling. Uh, skirtings, 90 by 19 pine, and architrave, 70 by 19 pine. Roof co cover, colour bond, so that fits in with our trusses at 1200 centres. If we're going to deviate from, from a sheet metal roof, might have to think about what we're doing with our trusses. Uh, kitchen cupboard, 600 wide, overhead cupboards, 300 wide, etc, etc. That's all, that's all very standard sort of kitchen sizes. And then we have our floor plan there, which, which no doubt everybody has seen. Now, 
Let's quickly flick up um, internal walls. All right, so internal walls, 90 by 35. Just a quick one on our plan. These dimensions are relating to our timber sizes. So that's, that's not showing our internal linings, which is the standard way for showing um, all of your, your internal walls, by the way, is you show the timber line, you don't show the 10 mil jib rock on either side. So yeah, here's our elevation, so our door and window head height at that, at that 2100, and on the inside of the rooms that'll give us 300 mil clearance between that and the ceiling. So that, that's the procedure document and, and all of our, our building information. So, so possibly there would be some ideas about the, the client consult from that. Um, now if we flick down to our client consult, just a quick run through that before we before we um, get into it. So, students are to be assessed on their ability to communicate with the client to gain the knowledge required to complete a full set of working drawings. Students shall be working independently. Students have one opportunity to speak to the client face to face. Should gaps be identified by assessors' feedback, the student shall have one opportunity to email the client for, for clarification. So we have a, have a chat, but you're probably going to have to have to clarify some things, and you get a chance in that email to clarify things. So the task should be could be observed under taking a clarification of brief, clarification of materials, use of appropriate industry language and terminology, discussion of incorporation of energy efficiency, sustainability aspects. Note taking and reflective listening skills. So you will have to be able to have to take notes, record the conversation in 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 manners if you can. Uh, so clarification slash discussion of non-compliance aspects. That's probably probably the main thing that you're going to have have some you know to, to confirm in, in email. With the client, the best you know that off the top of the head, off the top of your head, or the, or if you can say, look, I can't be sure, I have to check this, but I, you know, I think this is the this is the case, and and this is what we're we're most likely going to be looking at with the NCC or the or the, the council, etc. The more you know that, the the better, the better you appear, and also the better directed your your discussion your discussion can be. Um, but most likely you're going to have to confirm aspects, as and as you should. Um, it is fantastic to know plenty of things off the top of your head, but you should always have that humility to say, look, I want to confirm that and, and make sure of that. Don't don't go saying saying stuff that you you know um, you 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 regret regret saying later. So interpret slash discuss uh, numerical aspects of report design and then uh, finalisation of, of consultation. Uh, prior to consultation, students should undertake the brief analysis and desktop research. So you've all, all done that and done quite well at that. So yeah, for the, um, I haven't, haven't marked those, the, those resubmits, but that should, uh, yeah, I should get a, get a chance to do that soon. Students should prepare all their questions and points of clarification required from client prior to consultation. Student is to meet with the client at designated time location. So hopefully that we've got we've got one fellow working working over there. So I thought that that little room just over there is, is a great great space for it. Um, students will introduce themselves, explain who, what role they are undertaking in completion of client drawings. Uh, commence with discussion of brief provided by client. So, does everybody know, or does everybody understand their role in, in this subject? 
I think yeah. I'm getting it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. Okay. I think you're well, basically yeah. wanting okay. us to be able to um, be ready to go, meet with a client, discuss what they want, and design what they want so that we're ready to go do it. Yeah. Yeah. So that that know is, what we've yeah. Uh, basically talked to the client about and uh, prepare what we have to have for the for the council for planning approval. Yeah. Yeah. That is. Yeah. So that, that's that's your that's your role. What you've what you yeah that's your, that's your job. That's where I picked up yeah, today. Yes, yeah, yeah, <laughs> and that, that's great. That's yeah, and that, that, but I, I guess sort of what I was what I was looking because it's not actually clarified in there. The only only yeah, place people are actually working like what what job we are, what we're doing. It, exactly, and that, and that's not really clarified unless you go looking at the unit of competency and and what and this 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 course is to um, get you guys prepared to work for building designers. So you've got building designers, architects, engineers, you guys are the ones that, that work for them. Now, um, you know, I, I, I think um, I think most most certainly you, you've you've given you've given plenty of information and all this sort of stuff to you know to, to eventually sort of get out on your on your own and, and be the building designer on your own once you've once you've got a bit of experience under your belt and you can go, yep, yeah, alright, I can do this without exposing myself to too much liability and lawsuits. But for now at what what this, this course prepares you for is that. And so that's the that's the hat you've got to wear into this this client console. So you are that person that's in between the client and the building design. Now the building design might chat directly with the client as well, but um, you're I guess you're you're getting paid to do to do much of the legwork. Um, clarify aspects requested in brief from client that are non-compliant and their options. So discuss possible consequences for submitting drawings to council with non-compliant or compliance. I'd say compliant aspects. Clarify products to be used in construction. Discuss discuss energy efficiency, sustainability aspects that would benefit the design. So that there, there are some things that you have to have to do. Ensure use of appropriate industry language and terminology throughout the, the consultation on drawings, reports, etc. Ensure reports, design drawings, site dimension, setbacks, structural overall heights, window, etc., etc. Graphical information from reports are interpreted and discussed accurately. At conclusion of consultation, ensure students reflect slash summarise aspects gained from the consultation with the client. So, so you have to have to. So you have some discussion, and then you're required to reflect upon that. Of course, because you're going to have to get back to the client in. I, I, I imagine all of you will have to get back to the client in some regard, in in email. There'll, there'll have to be some, some clarification there. Unless unless you're unless you're you know super good, fantastic, um, and and find a way to discuss absolutely everything in ten minutes. Okay, so I'll just pause this recording.